<laughs> Bonjour, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Richard Worthington. I'll be your moderator for the second panel. And I'm also going to be doing a presentation, if I can get them to put it up there. But um, to dive straight in, I'm going to try and set the example of keeping my presentation to seven minutes maximum. Um, and I warn you presenters, if you go over eight minutes, I will stand up and start leering at you. So there will be pressure to conclude the formal inputs at the beginning so that we get a lot of chance for interaction. It's not to silence you, but simply to move into the interactive phase. My own input is largely around wanting to talk about the importance and the potential of an equity reference framework. This is an agenda item in the negotiations. It doesn't get as much attention as some of us believe it should get. And I believe it is central to getting a decent agreement in Paris. Um, there's a lot of work done on this by an outfit called Eco Equity. They put out a publication some years ago called The Gordian Knot. And it was talking about trying to unravel the connections between effectiveness, adequacy or ambition, and equity. And the argument is that if you only focus on adequacy and effectiveness, but you haven't served equity, you're not going to get people to agree to whatever these effective and adequate things are that are on the table. So equity as underpinning. I was very happy this morning to hear people recognizing that climate change is a social justice issue more than it is an environmental issue, which is why it's so challenging to negotiate about it. And also, talking about a carbon budget, but I'd like to emphasize carbon budgeting. The act of considering what activities are most deserving of using our collective carbon space. So if we only have a certain amount of carbon space or potential emissions that are acceptable, which activities have the greatest merit in terms of their benefits to society? So not just a matter of grandfathering from the past, the polluters get the rights to pollute and then get squeezed to reduce, but actually looking from the point of view of a global carbon budget and how best it is utilized to deliver the developmental objectives that we have. So that's my idea of what carbon budgeting is about. Um, now, talking about equity is sometimes divisive. Some people argue that it's so close to differentiation and differentiation of parties is such a difficult issue that if you bring it up, it could be, have a negative impact on the negotiations. The counter view is if we keep avoiding it, we'll keep avoiding an agreement. In fact, in the lead up to Copenhagen, there was quite a bit of discussion in civil society. I was working with the Climate Action Network around form versus content or substance. And some people were emphasizing the ones saying, you know, we need to get the commitments, we need the ambition now, and we can get the legal architecture in place afterwards. Others were saying, if we don't get the legal architecture in place first, then we won't be able to ratchet up ambition, and so the whole thing will fall apart. Um, some people after Copenhagen said, you see, we didn't prioritize form over content, and we didn't get a whole lot of either. Although I would agree that Copenhagen wasn't an utter failure, but we didn't get what we were looking for. So an equity reference framework is a tool on which, inter alia, we can build trust. Everyone talks about trust building, but that takes more than rhetoric. And so having a system which will really give us a clear breakdown of responsibility and capability of parties would be useful. Now, we're not going to get everyone to agree on the best way of doing this, and there is a tool online. If I can get my presentation up, I'll show you very briefly what this tool does. It provides an index of responsibility and capability that is generated from a whole bunch of parameters that you can choose from. So for responsibility, you can choose to count emissions from 1850, or you can pick a date any decade after that up to 2000. I think it goes up to 2000. So historical responsibility versus capability, you can change the weighting how much goes to responsibility, how much goes to capability. Capability is based largely on GDP per capita, not that the folks who made this thing think that GDP is a great measure of progress or success, but it is a measure that's recognized internationally as being related to capability. And the greenhouse development rights approach, I would really like to get the presentation up, please. Um, the greenhouse um, development rights approach says, well, we'll have an initial allocation per capita globally that is kind of set aside, representing the right to sustainable development. And then emissions over that level, um, correlated to, to the GDP, are then what are counted towards your responsibility. So this calculator uses the three scenarios that you see on the bottom right-hand graph there. Um, you've got a, a business as usual, and then the red line there is a, known as the G3 pathway, a weaker two degrees and a strong two degrees pathway. You might not like the names, but you get to choose out of three different global 
trajectories that you want to look at capability and responsibility for. Um, the principle of carbon budgeting is just illustrated on the left there and emphasizing that carbon budgeting is an attempt to get beyond the grandfathering approach where the polluter um, is empowered rather than paying. Uh, you've seen that graph already, Jean-Pascal put it up this morning, so I won't go over that again. Uh -huh. Um, so you can go online to the Climate Equity Reference Calculator and play around with this thing. I've just highlighted where you get to choose which of the pathways you want to look at. You can see you've got options of including particular kinds of emissions. Don't try and read it all now. I'm just encouraging you to go and look at it. I'm not going to demonstrate the tool. We don't have time. I'm just giving you a little flash of what it can do, but I'd like you to go there for yourselves and see, because you can generate these different tables um, that share out, for example, between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1, Depending on what settings you've chosen, it'll give you the weighting of responsibility and capability. You can change that index according to the different um, criteria. And then you can also look at, and it goes up to 2030, if you take those responsibility and capability indices, what kind of per capita emissions each of those countries would be entitled to under that system. It's illustrative, it's not prescriptive, okay? So you can do it for different countries. I've just highlighted the EU15 there, but you've got, you've got all of the countries in the negotiations and you can select which ones display. Interesting, because it's a social justice issue, they also look beyond parties to the convention and just look in terms of income. So. The, the first four categories you've got up there are global. So high, upper middle, lower middle, and all of these terms are obviously explained and how they derive it. But you can see how the, the responsibility spreads because it's my contention that the United Nations, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change or the multilateral system somehow, maybe beyond that, is going to have to confront privilege because climate change is a social justice issue. And some people are going to have to relinquish some of their privilege. If we do not phase out fossil fuels, we will phase out civilization. Now, it's not an overnight project. Um, I agree that we're not going to get rid of coal in 15 to 20 years out of all countries, but we have to phase it out or we phase out civilization. So we better start having a real consequent conversation about how, who, whose coal stays in the ground. And it's useful to have some objective indicators against which to have that kind of a conversation, and that's why I'm so keen on this particular tool, but I am wanting to keep my input short, so I'm going to finish with that last one, which just gives you an idea of the EU15 and France in particular, and I think that one has a negative value. I can't quite see from here. The point about a negative value of per capita emissions that a country is entitled to is precisely because we have to get to a world that is net zero. Let's not be afraid of net zero. We shouldn't be intimidated by that because some countries are going to have to fulfill a lot of their responsibility, capability, obligations, whatever you want to call them, effort sharing, burden sharing. They're going to have to support measures elsewhere. Because of the, the, the very strong emissions in the past, in future, their mitigation obligation is greater than their mitigation potential. So it appears in terms of a per capita allocation as a negative number. It doesn't imagine that those countries are necessarily going to have negative emissions on a national basis but it's a rating of capability or responsibility and obligation. So if you see negative per capita emissions for your country, it means you're going to have to be doing a lot of support and mitigation elsewhere. And I'm going to leave it there, but I'm hoping that the, the equity reference framework is something that can regain some attention before Paris, because I think it would be a really useful tool to help us build ambition if we can have a relatively objective point of reference to talk about, because we don't have to agree to use the calculator, we don't have to agree on, on the settings initially, but we should be putting something in place in Paris that gets us to moving towards an agreement on how we quantify equity. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. I will go to my chair. Thank you. And as, as I say, I'm going to be tight on time, so if we can now... Go to um, Corinne Lepage, you're up next. Thank you. I won't be giving introductions to all the speakers because you all have the manual with uh, their profiles in it, right? So, former minister and lawyer Corinne Lepage, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Seven minutes. I'll try to be brief. First of all, remind you that funding is a question of mitigation and adaptation. There are two sides to it. We shouldn't forget that. 
And the more we uh, progress, the more the question of adaptation and its funding is going to be a key question. You talked about equity. This is a very delicate issue because We've, you've talked about coal and fossil, uh, fossil fuels, but equity means you have to talk about the historic debt of equity amongst countries. But what does it mean, equity amongst or between countries, when Europe represents 11 percent, China 22 percent, but per inhabitant, a European uh, emits more than a Chinese. And thirdly, equity uh, talks about the real contributive capabilities of each state. In other words, how do you get the richest states of the planet to contribute? For example, the oil states, they consider that reducing uh, greenhouse gases uh, will be a great loss for them that they should be compensated for. So you have to keep all that in mind. When we talk about equity, we have to take all this into account, and it's not that simple. Thirdly, on the issue of financing or funding, you have to understand, and you've, you've said it more or less clearly, uh, dear moderator, uh, we will need breakthrough innovations. There will be technological, but also in terms of organization of society and operations of society. And we must talk about that when we talk about innovative funding. How will we achieve, will we manage to go beyond a certain number of stages that we as industrial countries have been through? Could we do for energy what we did for the phone, for the telephone? That is 1.5 billion people who have mobile phones never had a landline. Can we do something like that for energy with uh, innovations or breakthroughs of that magnitude? I think this is the topic we have to uh, grapple with. These are uh, breakthrough technologies that we need and that we don't have yet, keeping in mind that it's not only a question of technology, it's also a question, it's also a question of management and of society. I'm sorry to be a bit fast and giving you a long list of issues, but I think they're all very relevant. The Green Fund and funding. Uh, we, since Copenhagen, that is five years ago, we've been hi hiding behind the bush, talking about innovative funding for this uh, unfortunate green fund. It should have a hundred billion dollars in 2020. We've talked a lot about uh, its headquarters, its organization, who would be a member of the fund, uh, how to uh, grant investments and everything. But the whole question is, how are you going to bring in money to the fund? We haven't done much progress on that issue, and it is very clear that we need to be innovative. We need innovation, and we need to understand that $100 billion is only a part of the fund. Uh, because we will need a lot more for what we call the transition, not just the energy transition or the uh, ecological transition, the transition. Society, the global society from the 60s or the 80s or the 90s will have nothing to do with that of 2030. We can sit with the TICs already. What we're experiencing and will experience is that revolution plus the energy revolution, both. And there, for that, we need a lot of money for the South countries that will be the first to be impacted by that, and they don't have the necessary means to pay for the adaptation because they need money in particular to pay for the necessary investments required for this huge transition that is required in a very short period of time. In other words, we'll have to find new ways of working between the private and public sectors. We will need uh, consistent investments 
between the Green Fund, that is one thing, but also all sorts of investments that we will have to um, invest in energy, but other things as well in what we call the circular economy, the functional economy, to have a sustainable economy and to see how we will manage uh, huge cities with 30 to 50 million people in the framework of climate change. We want to do that. We want to achieve that with the Green Fund alone. So I wanted to stress this deep going transformation that we need. We're not talking about adding a few investments to the current system. We're talking about completely changing the system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Corinne. Very strict on the timing, a lovely example. Thank you. So we'll move straight on to Fergus Green from the London School of Economics. Fergus, um, whichever you prefer. If you don't have a presentation, speak from here is fine. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about, uh, since the theme of this panel is raising ambition, I'm going to talk about raising ambition beyond Paris. Um, and I want to emphasise, of course, that it's very important that we try and raise countries' uh, ambition. And I'm primarily going to talk about mitigation, just because that's the area that I work on. Um, but it's, of course, very important that we raise ambition as much as we can before Paris and during the Paris Climate Conference. Um, but I think, you know, given that we know that there is inevitably going to be a significant gap between the emissions reductions implied in the commitments countries bring to Paris, um, no matter how much you know, we can achieve in the next six months, uh, and where we need to be by 2030, say, to be on a two degree pathway or less, um, we therefore need to think about um, how we can raise ambition beyond Paris. And when I talk about beyond Paris, I mean both uh, raising ambition over the longer term, seeing climate action as a long term dynamic process, where it should become easier to raise ambition over time as technology costs come down um, and as technical and political barriers to more ambitious policy um, become gradually removed. So it's going to become easier, but we need to think about how we can accelerate that process. Um, so, it's, so it's temporal, about long, longer term than the next six months, and it's also about wider scope. Um, in terms of institutionally, thinking not just about the UNFCCC, important though that is, um, but about um, uh, other international institutions um, and, and domestic institutions as well. And so that's what I really want to argue today, is that if we're going to raise ambition um, over the longer term, then, we, then it's going to be centrally important that we focus on institutions, okay, designing and building um, the institutions that we need domestically and internationally to be able to ramp up ambition over time. And I'm going to focus on institutions in two areas uh, in my very brief remarks, um, and that's, uh, they are finance and innovation. So with regard to finance, um, just, to, just by way of context, we take our point of departure, in our, and I say we, our work at the, um, the Grantham Research Institute, our point of departure is not the need to raise $100 billion in terms of north-south climate finance flows by 2020, um, important though that is, but rather the need to invest um, on any trajectory about $6 trillion in infrastructure um, every year over the next 15 years. That's the estimate that the new climate economy um, project came up with about the investment needs even on a business as usual path. Okay, so the global economy is going to need about, so that add up, adds up to about $89 trillion cumulatively over the next 15 years of investment, particularly in energy systems and in cities, infrastructure. And what the new climate economy also found is if we wanted to make that investment low carbon, um, it would cost, 90, you know, rough, this, is, this is estimates, but roughly $93 trillion um, over the same time frame. So an incremental capital expenditure cost of about $4 trillion, which in the scheme of those figures is actually not that much. And the important point that they found was that, um, that the reduced operating expenditures of building low carbon infrastructure, particularly because we're using, we're using less fossil fuels, um, more than offset the additional capital cost. 
And then when you factor in the co-benefits like reduced air pollution um, from low carbon sources of energy, um, then the benefits are even greater. So what this tells us is that um, the low carbon infrastructure challenge is not an economic problem, actually, it's a financing problem. And the challenge largely is about raising and unlocking the, the additional capital expenditure needed to finance the low carbon pathway, which is actually going to be net beneficial in economic terms, you know, in most cases, um, for most countries. So, so the question then is, what kind of institutions do we need to reduce the cost of capital to unlock that investment um, uh, in, in low carbon uh, infrastructure? And here I just want to make one key point, which is that uh, one type of key institution that we're going to need is state investment banks. Uh, and I'm referring here to domestic state investment banks, like the China Development Bank or Germany's KFW, as well as regional investment banks like the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the, uh, the European Investment Bank, multilateral investment banks like the World Bank and the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and also sectoral focused um, state investment banks like the UK's Green Investment Bank or Australia's Clean Energy Finance Corporation. The key point is that these type of institutions play a very important role in reducing perceived risks, um, including perceived policy risk, in facilitating the sharing of risks, and in building specialist knowledge and capabilities um, in areas like low carbon investment. And as a result, they can significantly lower the cost of capital and unlock a lot of the finance that will be needed to finance low carbon infrastructure. Second and final point is on innovation. Um, again, by way of context, we know that actually the economic case for investing in support of innovation from research and development to the deployment of more mature for low carbon technologies is very, very strong. I don't have time to go into the case behind the economics of that, and I'm talking here at a domestic level, but just have to trust me for the moment that the economic case for investing in innovation, even on grounds other than climate change, purely as a stimulant to growth, is very strong. Yet what we see is that globally, um, innovation, uh, low carbon innovation, is underdone and underfunded. Um, one, one, I think, important statistic is that public finance for all energy research and development in the member states of the IEA is currently about half what it was in real terms in the late 1970s. And given the, the magnitude of the challenges we face on climate and energy security and air pollution and so on, I think that's a staggering indictment. Now obviously some of the funding is coming from non-IEA member states, particularly China. Um, but um, but you know, even when you add that in, there's still a large shortfall in, in where we need to go. So this gets us to the question of, you know, first of all, why is that? Um, I think there are probably a number of reasons why we see a kind of underfunding of innovation. But one of the reasons I think is that doing innovation well is difficult. It's, it's hard to kind of support innovation and the benefits are often uncertain and governments don't, tend not to like investing in things that are more uncertain than have more medium to long term payoffs. So what we really need is good analysis of how to design the kind of institutions we need, again, both domestically and internationally, um, to, to do innovation and to finance innovative companies um, and, uh, and innovative ideas, um, and then to, to implement them and then to evaluate them so we're constantly learning about how to do it better. Um, yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up there with, I guess, really a sort of, I think, a, a plea to really think about the importance of institutions, um, particularly as progressives who, you know, I think have played a historically important role in many countries around the world in creating, in, in sort of institutional innovation. Um, and I think if we can do that, that well, building new institutions to get uh, low carbon finance flowing and to get countries supporting and investing in innovation through things like um, you know, national research centres, you know, st investment banks have an important role in funding innovation, um, uh, in uh, technology demonstration and support kind of institutions as well, um, then we will actually go a long way to where we need to be to raise global ambition um, towards our long term goals. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Fergus.
So um, I will encourage you, if there's points that people have made that you'd like to hear elaborated, don't forget you can submit questions via SMS or tweet, get them on the, so that when we get to the interactive session, if there's particular things you'd like to emphasize, you as the participants more broadly have the opportunity to do that. But right now, we'll move on to hear from Travis McLeod from the Centre for Policy Development in Australia. Thank you, Richard. Uh, je ne parle français, je suis désolé. Uh, that's all I've got. <laughs> Can I acknowledge the organisers and thank them for doing such a brilliant job in bringing uh, this group together? I think it would be remiss of me to say that the irony of being an Australian on this panel following an Australian who's living in London about raising ambition on climate change is, is pretty stark. Uh, it's not lost on me. Australia has dramatically uh, lowered its ambition. Let's be clear, um, we're the only developed country to remove an effective and operating price on carbon. Last year, the trends in investment in renewable energy went against us. Um, because of that policy uncertainty, it fell 35% in Australia for small scale projects and 88% for large scale projects. Our emissions reduction target by 2020 is a paltry 5%. All this while we remain probably the largest uh, per capita emitter among rich countries. That's the first caveat. Uh, forgive me for being an Australian on this panel. The second thing is that, and it was touched on this morning, while ours and other governments have um, tentatively signed up to the two degree Celsius target, um, we heard that it's illusory under present trends and in fact um, probably won't be enough. So the scale of the ask is substantial. What I want to do in the six minutes I've probably got left is make the case for three necessary conditions for raising ambition and in doing so fostering the sorts of innovative solutions that have been outlined by the first two speakers. The first is to be clear that certain impacts have moved from the intangible to the tangible, even at one degrees. The second is to be equally clear that the largest intangible to resolving climate change is the failure of liberal democracies and the multilateral system to do so. And the third is to embrace disruption that's required by this and minilateralism. And I'll build on the point that Professor Golden made this morning. So first, I think the silver lining that the Foreign Minister touched on earlier this afternoon, and for me the biggest change since Copenhagen, has been that the burning platform that supposedly didn't exist uh, now exists particularly in the realm of security. We have seen observable security impacts, which has meant that many of the, the policy actors or veto players have moved into the actionable side of the policy ledger. Witness the Pentagon, uh, the Bank of England, and increasingly insurance companies who are seeing the actuarial costs of natural disasters grow substantially. I think the security lens needs to become far more prominent. Admiral Locklear, who is the four-star uh, general in charge of US Pacific Command, has identified climate change as the largest uh, long-term security threat in the Asia-Pacific region. In the most recent congressional testimony, he said that the Asia-Pacific region, uh, sorry, the Indo-Asia-Pacific region accounted for 40%, more than 40% of natural disasters reported worldwide. And this increasing tendency, coupled with the billions of people, some two billion, that live in low-lying coastal areas will mean that that displacement um, and disaster, geographical and geopolitical, wrought by increasing uh, temperatures in that region will be significant in the near term, not in the medium or longer term. This view has been supported by insurance companies like Suncorp Life, who have said that their actuarial costs have demonstrated that the increasing um, uh, monetary costs of countering natural disasters, which is falling to the insurance companies, is becoming um, is becoming um, significant. So I think part of raising the ambition is aligning the story of opportunity, which is around innovation and green growth, with also the story about fear, which is most manifest, I think, through a security prism. The second point I want to make is the intangible, which I think is becoming increasingly exposed. And that's the crisis across liberal democratic systems and the multilateral framework in countering climate change effectively. I think climate change is symptomatic of and accelerates the crisis across those systems and we can't fix one problem 
without fixing the other. The frustration with the lack of future focused action has become the signature tune of people like us in this room. Speed, scale and complexity do not mesh well with the democratic structures built for the 20th century. However, as we heard this morning, there is much similarity between climate change and some of the other threats that are facing us over the next few decades. Pandemics, cyber security, base profit shifting and tax erosion, insurgencies, resource scarcity, etc. Climate change is at the forefront because it's the best known of these existential threats. It also most clearly embodies the old economy and old energy versus the new economy and transitioning it. But I think that successfully counteracting climate change requires dealing with this systemic crisis which is infecting our democracies and our multilateral framework. And it also requires disincentives, and we might call these the, the Tony Abbott or the Stephen Harper clauses, to prevent retreat, similar to the way the WTO has done this through its multilateral frameworks, locking the gate, if you will, on commitments that are made so there can't be retreat from them once they have been uttered. Commitments must secured must accrue incentives over time to outlast individual political cycles. The final point is about embracing disruption and minilateralism. We heard this morning the proposal for the C20, C30, C40 coalition of cities, companies and countries working to combat climate change, a coalition of the working um, beyond Paris, irrespective of what the Paris outcome is. I think 12 countries are responsible for 80% of emissions and we've seen commitments in sub-national jurisdictions that dwarf commitments that could be made by other national jurisdictions and those in addition to those being made by companies need to become more prominent in the way we calculate the changes that are required and the progress that is being made. I want to finish with two examples of how disruption and change is possible even within an environment such as in Australia that has become quite toxic with dealing with climate change on a national level. The first is the Climate Council. So one of the first moves of the Abbott government was to abolish the Independent Climate Commission. And within a week, crowdfunding raised over $2 million to ensure that that council could re-establish itself independently of government and of the parliament with the same commissioners, which is, was an outstanding achievement. It occurred at the grassroots level within a period of days. The second is one of those state targeted banks that Fergus just referred to, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Now again, that was another institution that was mooted for abolition by the new government, but the Senate um, successfully blocked that abolition. Now if you take the first year of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation's operation, it funded, it contracted investments of about $900 million and secured two times as much, $2 billion, so $3 billion of contracted investments. And we've seen the yield on those forecast to be 7% over the next five to 10 years, more than double the government bond rate. Those positive stories of disruption at the sub-national level, be it through business, investment, um, or through action being taken by civil society, demonstrate the capacity to be innovative and to raise ambition, even if the national political climate or the international multilateral framework might not be as conducive. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Travis. So we're, we're hearing quite a bit about what um, needs to happen beyond um, Paris, and I anticipate some questions coming back to speakers already to say, well, what can we get in Paris to help put in place the things that we won't get there? Um, in the case of, a, of an equity reference framework, probably the best we will get is an agreement that we should have one and agree to start working on it collectively. Um, if we can get that, that will be a result. So please think about that while the other people are also speaking. But now we'll move on to Claire Langley, Director of Policy and Research at Climate Advisors in Washington. Claire. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have a couple slides. If you could put those up, that would be great. Um, Thank you very much. So I'm here today to talk about an idea that my organization has been discussing um, here in Europe and also in the United States over the past several months in order to try and raise ambition ahead of COP21 and, and indeed beyond Paris. Um, so the idea is for the US, EU, and other G7 economies to come together 
and pledge not only what they're willing to do alone at home unilaterally, uh, but also to commit to mitigation targets outside their borders. So a dual commitment. Um, specifically, the ask is for these countries to pledge to reduce 1 billion tons of CO2 per year by 2020 in developing countries um, on top of the targets that they've outlined in their INDCs. So I'll just go through a little bit of the analysis um, that underlines this idea. Um, this idea really is designed to come up with a solution that solves the growing problem of the mitigation gap. So the good news is the Paris Agreement is taking us a major step forward. Several countries are coming out with their national plans this year for reducing emissions. Some of them, these plans are being done for the first time ever. But uh, unfortunately, it's clear that these aren't going to be enough to fill the, the mitigation gap. Um, the analysis that we did back in December looks at pledges that came out already from the EU, US, and China. And we also made assumptions for countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil, and others, OECD countries, um, least developed countries, um, to the pledges that we think that they might put forward um, looking at the possible technical and political constraints that they're under. So this graph shows you the business as usual trajectory, um, the gray line, the dotted uh, orange line is the emissions trajectory we need to stay on to stay at two degrees. Um, and this, the dark blue line is a, a strong pledge scenario with ambitious policies. Um, and this shows us that we can get about halfway toward closing the mitigation gap. So in the weak pledge scenario, which is the light blue line, um, we see the world only sees a small reduction from business as usual. So this shows us that you know, this is, is sobering analysis, but it's unsurprising given that we're in a, this unilateral, unilateral bottom-up world um, where voluntary action kind of makes up the sum of global climate action. So the Paris process is showing us we can get halfway there, but it's, and, you know, which is pretty good, but it's not enough. Um, and so what we need to do is go beyond these unilateral self-financed actions, uh, so countries need to work together abroad. So as a result of this massive gap in collective action, we are proposing that developed countries partner with uh, developing countries on international mitigation partnerships. So this could be a pledge, as I said earlier, to reduce tons abroad, uh, additional, an additional pledge to what's set out in the INDCs. And we're asking the EU specifically to take a leadership role in this, to pledge 1 billion tons of CO2 by 2020 in developing countries, and on top of its, its additional pledge, its existing pledge of at least 40%. Um, and we realize that this is, this is a big ask. The 40% target was um, a result of very contentious negotiations, so we're under no illusions of how difficult something like this might be. But if we think that, if we ask Europe to take a leadership role, we're hoping that they can then ask other G7 economies, uh, the United States in particular, to follow along their lead. Um, so these type of partnerships, we are asking that they, sec they target sector-specific projects. Um, achieving results-based mitigation reductions. Uh, examples could be limiting tropical deforestation, phasing down HFCs, um, making progress on energy efficiency, uh, increasing renewable, renewable energy deployment, and so on, um, with several benefits. So this could, be, it could help enable developing countries to go beyond what they're willing to do alone or what they're able to do alone. Uh, for developed countries, they provide cost-effective mitigation reductions. As we know, the cheapest tons are found in developing countries. This could also help mobilize climate finance from new sources uh, and delivering on results-based reductions, so help kind of solve the climate finance problem we'll see in Paris, and also help deliver on uh, development goals. So we know this year uh, the post-2015 development agenda is another big agreement we're hoping to get in September, so the sustainable development goals will need to be realized. So we think this idea is completely consistent with the bottom-up world that we're now living in. Um, this could be something that's part of the formal process at Paris, uh, countries could put forward conditional pledges alongside what they're willing to do alone, such as what Mexico has done. It could also be announced at Paris as a political declaration, um, something to kind of in increase the overall level of ambition. Um, it could also be part of an initiative that's uh, announced as, as part of the Lima Paris action agenda. So there's some flexibility on how this is done. So. Uh, one of the other uh, reasons why we think this is an interesting proposal is it could really help with some of the financial uh, issues that are going to be coming up at, at Paris. 
The lack of finance is a major risk to reaching an agreement. And so shifting the way that finance is discussed, talking about it more in terms of tons and results-based mitigation, can help communicate progress and, and help governments explain where their money is going. So we think government should see this as an option and an, an opportunity to raise ambition. Um, working with countries that they prioritize, uh, strategic partners, and in uh, sectors that they both mutually prioritize. So this could promote a race to the top as the most ambitious countries come together to work together. So I think I'm running out of time, but I just want to leave on a positive note and say that the demand for these types of partnerships exists already in developing countries, as I mentioned with Mexico's um, conditional pledge. And we've also seen at Lima, with the Lima Challenge, countries, forested developing countries come forward uh, to say the action they're going to take, but also what they're willing to do with additional support. So um, hopefully this is something we can get into more in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And if that idea really catches on, then perhaps the, the framing in India might change from the inevitability of doubling coal consumption to the, the question of whether there needs to be a full doubling of coal consumption to achieve um, the eradication of poverty and, and development goals. And we now move on. And please, super quiet right now, because Gwyn is losing her voice, but she is going to try to make it through her presentation for us, Gwyn Tarask. Thank you. Um, I apologize for my voice, and I hope you can understand me anyway. Um, so as a member of the progressive climate community in the United States, I thought I would start by first speaking about what achieving ambition means in the US case right now in the current political environment. Um, and then I might actually stop there since we're pressed for time. Um, so in contrast to what Travers was just saying, in the US we, um, we find ourselves in a completely new position because for the first time the country is achieving real success in climate action both internationally and domestically. Um, and this is thanks to um, executive action. To give you some examples, um, 10 days ago, the US just submitted its formal INDC, its post-2020 emissions reduction goal. Um, and the, the target is both very ambitious and also achievable. Um, it's for a 26 to 28% reduction below 2005 levels by 2025. And 2025 is a, an early end date. And just to illustrate the ambition here, um, that target represents a 9 to 11 percentage point reduction from the 2020 target. I'm sorry, I did not bring in a chart. Um, but it's a very steep decline, and it's a steep decline within just five years. Um, secondly, the US is, is using this newfound ambition and is trying to forge new alliances among parties. Um, we just saw the US-China announcement last year, um, which several people have mentioned today. Um, and it really represented, we think, a tectonic shift in the dynamics of the negotiations. Um, it, it wasn't just that the US and China were coming forward with ambitious goals, but rather, even more importantly, that they were coming forward with the, these ambitious goals alongside one another. Um, and I, I think that signifies, I hope, that we're moving into a, a new climate regime that's marked more by cooperation and less by um, antagonism. Um, and the last example, um, we've also had ambition on, on finance as well. Um, President Obama pledged $3 billion to the Green Climate Fund, the GCF, in, in November in Brisbane. And I think many people here realize the importance of the GCF, um, not just for the, the success of the Paris Agreement, and it is very important for building trust among the parties, um, but also for development and the massive project of decoupling development from rising emissions, because we know that in the long run, and perhaps the not so long run, uh, development and rising emissions are at odds. Um, the GCF is also important because it's dedicated to adaptation, which is chronically underfunded. It's dedicated to 
adaptation in the least developed countries, which is even more chronically underfunded. And it's dedicated to mobilizing private finance, which realistically is going to be needed to start closing the funding gap. So the president has made these commitments. Um, he's made them within 24 months of leaving office. Um, so he is passing on these commitments and the international pressure that goes along with them to the next administration. Um, but he's also leaving with He's also leaving the next administration with the, the means of implementation, the means of fulfilling these obligations. I'm sorry, I'm a mess. Um, um, and that's because the United States um, right now has a priority of completing its clean power plan. 40% of GHG emissions in the United States are from electric utilities. And the clean power plan is going to go a long way toward reducing that by setting state level emissions reduction standards. Um, so this policy, along with a basket of other policies, including notably forthcoming methane, methane regulations, um, I think they're going to allow the United States to meet its 2020 goal. And more importantly, I think it's going to put the 2025 goal within reach. That goal is, to be honest, right, it's a stretch. I don't think anyone will say otherwise. Um, the US is really pushing itself here. But I think that's what we want, right? We all want to push ourselves. Uh, so I think these are achievements in themselves. Um, but they're certainly achievements given the fact that we have a Congress right now in the United States, as you probably know, that has a very vocal faction that's in opposition to any climate cooperation and any climate action. Um, which leads me to the point of what achieving ambition means in the United States right now. What it means is um, protecting these gains that have been made under the current administration in so little time. <coughs> Um, we have to get the clean power plan done, and the final regulations on that are expected this summer. We then have to defend the clean power plan. We have to follow through on the first installment toward the $3 billion pledged to the GCF, so we have to get that money appropriated. Um, and you know, those of us in the climate community in the United States are arguing sort of tirelessly for these things. Um, and we're optimistic, or I'm, out, I'm optimistic, I'll speak for myself. Um, it's worth noticing here, and I think this might not be generally known outside of the country, that public opinion in the U.S. is actually on the right side of these issues. A new poll just came out two weeks ago that found that 72% of Americans support the U.S. becoming a party to an international agreement. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would take the opportunity while I have you to warn you um, that these very vocal factions, they're peddling several false narratives, right, in order to sabotage the agreement, in order to sabotage cooperation among the parties, um, in order to sabotage, right, any climate action. <clears throat> um, first of all, they're turning to the international community and they're saying the U.S. will never meet its targets. Then they're turning back to us in the US and they're saying China is being disingenuous, right, when they've announced the 2030 peak. India is being disingenuous when they speak about their very ambitious solar targets. Um, <clears throat> so they're trying to sow distrust among the parties here. Um, another interesting but mistaken narrative that I might warn you about while I have you um, is that the Obama administration is somehow illicitly trying to bypass the U.S. Senate in order to become a party to the Paris Agreement, um, thereby putting U.S. participation on sort of shaky legal ground. And again, there's just absolutely no evidence of, of any illicit activity. And it's worth noting here that the vast majority of international climate agreements um, binding international climate agreements that the U.S. enters are entered not via advice and consent of the Senate, 
but they're entered as executive agreements, um, and there are many different sorts of executive agreements that rest on different baskets of authorities, um, which I'm happy to talk to some of you about after the conference on the off chance that you're interested in. Um, so, um, there's this effort to sow mistrust among the parties, the dangers of which I think the Secretary General of the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance was just advising us against in the last panel. Um, and I think I should leave it at that in the interest of time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gwyn. And um, we have two more formal presentations before going into the more interactive session. Next up is Robert Ladresh, professor at Keele University in the UK. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the uh, Fondation Jean Jaurès and uh, FEPS for the invitation to participate in this um, very interesting gathering today. My expertise is not on climate change. Uh, it is rather how political parties develop their position on climate change. And so I'm going to report some findings on a project that I'm leading on this very uh, issue, which I think feeds into the broader bottom-up uh, ambitions for international negotiations. Let me first begin by mentioning the findings of a recent study um, that should be good news for progressives. Left-leaning governments, this is Annex 1 governments, are more inclined to pass unifying flagship legislation, for example, the 2008 British Climate Change Act, or more recently, climate change acts last year in Denmark and Finland. They are more likely to intervene in the energy sector or promote low carbon research and development and they are also more interested in green investment as a counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Still, in general, the findings of the study find that bipartisanship is the norm. That is, of course, outside of current Anglo-American uh, countries uh, that we've, we've heard some in passing. Now, when we speak of governments in international climate negotiations, we must not forget the fact that, at least when we are speaking of Western democracies, that they are party governments, whether they're one-party majority governments or coalition governments. So how do mainstream parties, center-left as well as center-right, develop their positions on climate change? Now, based on a project that I lead entitled Climate Policy and Political Parties in Western Europe, I'll quickly share some headline points or findings that help to explain past ambitions and perhaps contribute to the wider debate on global ambitions. So there are five findings that I'll very quickly go through and perhaps afterwards we can expand on these. And some of these at first will look fairly straightforward. The first is party modernization. There's evidence that in the last 10 years, some parties, whether on the left and even on the right, in order to reach out to new voters or potential coalition partners, have modernized or rebranded their political party in embracing the, the agenda of climate change. We've seen this, as I said, uh, on the left, but also on the right. How deep it... it um, it develops on right-wing parties is something that is to be proved in their actual uh, policy and negotiating positions. Secondly, leadership. While environmental policy has not had so prominent a profile in social democratic parties, leadership on climate change can be advanced by a party leader or other senior members of a government uh, for instance, uh, names come to mind, Sven Auken in Denmark in the 1990s, or in the context of the development of the British, U the um, 2008 Climate Change Act, I might mention David Miliband in passing. However, in some governments where there's, they've put on the books climate policy integration, 
for example, where there may exist an interministerial committee on climate change chaired by an environment committee, it's not enough to simply have the government structure if it's not supported by senior government leaders, whether that's a prime minister or other senior members of a cabinet. So we can put into, into government formation the means by which to integrate climate into other policies, but unless there's political backing to that, especially when there's a clash between interests, then it doesn't advance. So leadership. Thirdly, and this should, should not be a surprise, government coalition partners. The greater attention paid to climate mitigation policies has also come about due to the terms, the terms of a coalition agreement. Now, quite often, that might be with a so-called Green Party in a political party system, but also, at times, this can be with a centrist or even a center-right political party. So, for example, we see today in Germany a grand coalition of the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, and despite that fact, we still have progress being made on their energy venda, their energy transition. Now, I might point out that our study does draw a distinction of right-wing parties between those of a Christian democratic heritage, which quite often have an environmental wing in it, and those parties, quite often liberal parties, that have adopted over the last 20 years a much more neoliberal economic policy. And I think that characterizes, as I mentioned in passing, the Anglo-American uh, countries, but not only. There are also continental liberal parties uh, that come to mind that have, that have much lower ambitions in climate mitigation policy. I'll mention just one example. Last year, as I said, Denmark passed the Climate Change Act. All of the main parties in government, uh, all of the main parties in the party system voted for it, except the far-right Danish People's Party and the Liberal Party the major party on the center right. So supported by the centrist and the parties of the left and the small Danish conservative party, but not by the liberal party, which complains that it would undermine competitiveness, a term I'll return to uh, in a moment. Fourth, economic conditions. Within social democratic parties, sometimes the most difficult individual to convince regarding climate mitigation policies for instance, along the lines of a carbon tax, is one's finance minister. This is one reason why social democratic parties are more likely to emphasize their policies couched in the terms of job creation rather than more straightforwardly climate change. And then lastly, public opinion and also the arguments used by the opposition. As we heard this morning, climate change may not be one of the top concerns of the electorate. It certainly might be in the top 10, but not in the top three, which may be employment, health, education, security, depending on the country. This is a good reason then to link aspects of climate change to other policies, as we've heard this morning and we've heard uh, so far this afternoon. Whilst it remains a green issue, it becomes compartmentalized and segregated. So the more it's linked to other policies, the more successful can be the uh, policy development and implementation. Now, I will end on two points. The first, I mentioned competitiveness. We've seen that the arguments against ambitious domestic climate mitigation policies have been that it would undermine the competitiveness of business and the economy. Whether this is traditional economic growth or simply parties on the right supported by vested interests. I believe that progressives have to own the competitiveness argument, reframe economic growth in a more positive and easy to understandable way for voters, such that sustainable development, again, isn't simply a green issue and left on the side. And finally, as Teresa Ribera mentioned this morning, we have to mainstream 
climate change into other policy discourses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, and an excellent job on timing. He was planning on 10 minutes, and I cut him down, and he stuck to it, so well done. Thank you. I am going to use the excuse of your mentioning a carbon tax just to reassure folks that um, the Treasury in South Africa just two days ago recommitted to the introduction of the carbon tax in South Africa next year, despite some vociferous opposition from the likes of Sassel. So our Treasury has said we're staying, we're staying on track, and it'll be carbon tax in 2016. But um, before we go into more general discussion, our final input, Pervenche Berez, a member of the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, your two last uh, speech were just in line with where I want to go. Uh, and I'm going to focus on financing the transition innovation, innovative uh, solution. This is going to be my, my main point. But d'abord, je voudrais um, uh, faire une citation. Let me begin with a quotation from Andrew Steer, who's a chairman and CEO of the World Resource Institute, who told us that every year throughout the world, two trillion dollars are spent, externalities included, to encourage the consumption of fossil fuels, while only one trillion is spent to encourage populations to give pride of place to renewable energies. I think that's a a good reflection of uh, what we need to discuss here today. I think it should also be pointed out that uh, there's a lot in the hands of private investors and indeed institutional investors such as sovereign funds, pension funds and other long-term investors. Today, what we call the green economy represents in these long-term investors' portfolio approximately 1% of the so-called portfolio. That's uh, an idea of what a big challenge we have to take up if we are to achieve the very modest ambition of 10% by 2020. That's why I propose to focus my uh, talk on uh, what uh, could be a, uh, a decalogue of innovative propositions to help better funding of the green economy. Two ideas I'd like you to bear in mind. First of all, we need to uh, foster investment for the green economy, while bearing in mind that as progressives, the issue of uh, trade-offs between funding the climate and funding social economic challenges such as education, health, housing, or others, isn't actually a trade-off in real terms. It's by funding the, the, the climate that we will help better fund these other top priorities for progressives. The second thing I would like to mention before going through my 10 proposals is the notion that uh, including with a view to the, uh, the the Paris conference, we need to really get it at the very heart of this whole system. We shouldn't ask the question as uh, as stakeholders in funding. We should really, I think, look at the very heart of how the modern economy is funded and financed. So, as Europeans, I think we really have challenges. We have a a commissioner called Jonathan Hill, who was appointed by the UK, and Jonathan Hill's job is to uh, anticipate the uh, European Union's capital markets in the years to come, which raises the question of the uh, tomorrow's capital markets in uh, the EU and the uh, funding of the, uh, uh, the green economy. Modern economies uh, haven't asked themselves that question. That is what I think really is the core question in this whole issue. So the first innovative idea is we need to find means and tools to reorient incentives to invest in the long term. If we do not include climate issues in this long-term perspective, we will find ourselves with an equation which is quite simply, uh, I quote, we have 1.2 trillion euros invested in energy of which 80% is invested in fossil fuels and 20% in renewables. That means that we have to organize ourselves to fund zero carbon energy, to fund more sustainable agriculture, or to fund uh, 
means of transport with uh, uh, no CO2 emissions. The second idea is the uh, uh, mobilization of public guarantees for uh, uh, the green economy. We've begun to think about this here in France, and a number of parts were explored during the national debate on the energy transition. There was a feasibility study conducted uh, on the uh, funding of this uh, energy transition, which uh, should uh, uh, give pride of place to the renovation, energy, energy renovation of, of, uh, of uh, public, uh, uh, public property. And I apologize for this list. And the third idea is to mobilize uh, investment at European level, the so-called Juncker plan. Now, I think we have really have our work cut out here. Next Tuesday, the uh, ITRE Commission, which is a uh, commission on energy, we will vote two amendments that propose to mobilize between 20 and 25 percent of that guarantee in a very clearly indicated way in favor of uh, energy transition. It's no guarantee that this vote will be approved because the Conservatives are telling us that it's really for the market to decide and for private investors to decide what the investment priorities should be. Uh, clearly, if we do not uh, earmark or ring fence certain parts of uh, these funds uh, to uh, orient uh, investment, if we do not have this ring fencing, we're going to lose a great opportunity. Fourth idea is the whole issue of mobilizing public banks, be it at uh, national or European level. We should be able to define objectives in terms of uh, investment in the green economy or in low carbon uh, sectors of the economy. At the Franco-German Council of Ministers meeting, the idea of mobilizing the Caisse de Depot and the KFW uh, with a view to investing in structures uh, that uh, give pride a place to energy efficiency. This is an idea that has been uh, approved. I think that this is an area where we should... Uh, I think multilateral banks have approved this approach, be it the World Bank, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, European uh, uh, Development Bank or others. The fifth idea is the idea of uh, setting up labels, low-carbon labels, for instance, again with a view to earmarking a special investment. Sixth idea would be to uh, mobilize uh, uh, certain funding that uh, could be bought up by the central bank. Now, France strategy and Michel Aglietta has worked or uh, have worked on this idea based on the principle that from the European point of view, we are at a very, very important uh, crossroads. We need to act against climate deregulation and yet uh, get out of uh, our sluggish eco e economy. The idea is to make the idea of uh, the European Central Bank buying up private securities uh, with, uh, that will be guaranteed by public authorities. This would uh, place the value of uh, a low carbon at a, an acceptable value. In the same uh, mindset, I understand that the central banks of Brazil and China are working on the possibility of uh, fostering green investment in the form of private funds for these uh, particular areas. Sixth idea two uh, tax uh, aspects, either the, uh, the carbon tax, and I'm delighted that Afri South Africa has made great strides forward in this area, but this is an issue not just here in France, but at European level, uh, and an issue that we need to revisit. I think uh, the, we need to make a lot of progress, obviously, when we talk about uh, 
energy taxation, the uh, social cost has to be borne in mind. Second aspect of this sixth uh, idea is the uh, notion of uh, a tax on financial transactions, these funds uh, to be uh, earmarked, as the uh, President of France said earlier this year, uh, for green investment. Ninth idea is the uh, whole issue of bank regulations, regulation of the conditions under which green investment is funded. In uh, bank capital, there is no uh, earmarking of uh, capital employed for any particular area. The only uh, issue is the quality of the financial security uh, uh, transacted. But the actual content of the investment is never taken into account. Here, I believe that for progressives, this is an area worth exploring and promoting. Final idea of my decalogue is the role of the rating agencies. And this brings me back to the point uh, mentioned earlier by, by um, Trevor McLeod when he said that the issue of risk and safety were taken into account by market players. But if they are to take risk into account, the climate risk or health risk, well, then they will surely take account of the uh, value to be added by earmarking funding when assessing uh, 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 transactions or operations in the market or when rating uh, companies in particular. There is a quick catalog of uh, 10 ideas, my decalogue as I call it, of uh, areas to be explored. Uh, you'll see that these ideas all converge. But the, I think the uh, people involved in this debate have a lot to say to uh, people in the, in the markets in order to mobilize long-term funding for this uh, huge challenge facing us, which is the challenge of uh, reorienting uh, investment in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pere Branche. And we will be conducting the rest of this discussion largely in English, but of course the translation will continue as needed. We haven't had that many questions coming in, but those that have come in include, well, we've heard some, some response to this, what can central banks do? Um, and a suggestion that the Paris Agreement needs to save the EU emissions trading system. How, how to save the EU emissions trading system it could be pivotal to the Paris Agreement. Um, and another question that came in was around the role of insurance companies, particularly with regard to loss and damage. So, Travis, if you'd maybe like to, to lead the, the responses, particularly on, on insurance companies there, I was very happy to hear a reference to financial transfers tax. It was uh, an, an issue on which there was some campaigning happening previously, but it seems to have gone quiet lately. I'm glad not entirely. Didn't hear any mention of bunker fuels levy, which was at one stage an idea that was being quite heavily punted, but it seems to have been um, blown away by the international institutions um, responsible for governance of bunkers fuels. That's fuels used in international trade. So if anyone's got anything to add on prospects for that still happening, I'd be happy to hear it. But Travis, if you'd like to lead us off and and um, then I'll, I'll look for those most keen to follow up. Sure, thanks, Richard. Um, well, just on the question of, of risk and, and insurance, I, one thing to note, I mean, the banks, the central banks were mentioned earlier. Andrew Haldane, who's the chief economist at the Bank of England, has, has actually written some, some quite profound um, pieces of work for a, a central bank economist. The Bank of England, of course, have just introduced climate risk analysis, uh, and Haldane's piece on the short long demonstrates fairly graphically uh, the, the short-term incentives that are dominating a lot of the risk matrices that businesses are using and how short-sighted um, that is if you actually measure those risks over the longer term. So Haldane has actually been making the case fairly profoundly for reorienting um, longer-range risk analysis to improve um, not just the, the rate of return for the community and society at large, but also demonstrating that lower yields over time will be better for, for shareholders. On insurance and risk, I'm not a, an actuary, uh, and it's only been relayed anecdotally to me, but 
recently in Australia, particularly in far north Queensland, there have been some fairly dramatic and severe uh, cyclones that have caused um, huge amounts of damage, which have seen the state of Queensland declared a natural disaster zone on several occasions and the state of Western Australia recently. And that has led a number of insurance companies to raise their premiums substantially in those areas. Um, the consequence of that was that you had several conservative politicians, um, including those from regional areas, advocating for the government to start taking an interest in providing insurance for those areas that were more susceptible to natural disasters and cyclones. And so the logical end of that conversation was a discussion about the costs of those disasters over the, the longer term. And the comments that um, Admiral Locklear, the four-star general, has made about the fact that 40% you know, of natural disasters are in that um, Pacific Indian Ocean area, they're rising. And those insurance companies that have actually taken a longer term view on this have had actuaries measure the costs. And the costs are so significant, you will see those areas becoming uninsurable unless there's some way to mitigate uh, the costs of those, which, you know, it's why I kind of mentioned that role of security agencies, because they obviously play a role in stability operations and humanitarian operations where um, government agencies cannot. So these are, you know, very much interlinked risk analysis, um, the costs of private uh, insurance and the role that the government must and, and the military will need to play where those risks, as they ultimately do, fall back on the state. Um, and I think of the private companies that are, that are leading the way in understanding those costs, it's those naturally with the most to lose. And that's why the insurance companies, I would suspect, will start um, being a little bit more vociferous in campaigning for um, action on climate change. Thanks for that. It also reminds me of a facility we have in South Africa is the Road Accident Fund. And, and funds for that are raised um, through, a, through a levy on fuel sales. And so the state has a, a fund to deal with um, loss and damage as a result of, of accidents on the roads. So if we can do it for the roads, there's no reason that I'm aware of that we wouldn't be able to do it. It's more complicated to get claims because when you're hit by a car, it's pretty clear what's hit you. Um, in the case of climate change, it's not always quite as, as unequivocal as that. But um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear from others too on, on parallels where there may be some kind of public institution that is, is trying to provide support for people who are, are subject to loss or damage as a result of climate change. Corinne, you mentioned um, that, that what is sometimes a hated word in negotiations, compensation. Um, and my understanding is that the, the discussions around loss and damage have been trying to kind of get away from the past uh, the, sorry, you've got a question of clarity there? I don't think I use the word compensation. For, yes, for oil producing countries, yes. It's not something that I support. It is, however, a fact. Certainly, I experienced this in Warsaw at the uh, Conference of Parties. One of the issues on the table was the request made by oil producing countries who believed that the reduction of greenhouse gases and non-utilization of all possible hydrocarbon uses was for them a loss and a result of which they wanted to be compensated. That's what I said. Not to support the idea, on the contrary, to contest it. <laughs> Obviously, uh, these oil producing countries are wealthy countries, if not very wealthy countries, and have every reason to feel that they have become even wealthier uh, with these greenhouse gases. So it would only be fair that they uh, take an active part in uh, funding, uh, uh, at least the adaptation phase. Their position, however, is exactly the opposite. They're saying, not at all, we would be victims of these new policies, as a result of which we would uh, ask for compensation. That's what I meant to say, and nothing else. Certainly not in support of the idea, but on the contrary, to oppose it. Is, is that clear now? <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. I was, I was actually... <laughs> I, w I was working up to wanting to very clearly distinguish between that kind of compensation that you very clearly say, set out and the kind of, of 
loss and damage issues that come up under adaptation, which is not, well, it's useful not to use the same word for the two things and, and hence focus on, on the loss and damage um, related to climate change being something which certainly is deserving of, of financing, but on a very different level to foregone revenues from, I mean, we, we, we use a different argument with our government and say that, that um, we are foregoing the revenues that we could be getting out of renewable energy because we don't seem to be able to see natural resources unless they're under our feet, we can dig them out of the ground and own them. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the arguments that people are, are entitled to get revenue for, for natural resources, I mean, where would you end? Um, but. Moving on to some of the other panelists, and I don't know if, um, Fergus, you'd like to address the... Mais j'ai pas proposé qu'on le fasse, hein? I haven't suggested we compensate people who have natural resources. Yes, no, I wasn't meaning to suggest that you had. <laughs> no, but rather that, that um, we need to be a lot more... Um, inclusive in, in talking about resource endowments because so far they've mostly been used to refer to fossil fuels when there's a whole lot of other resources that aren't being utilized and could be. But um, on, on other institutions and making provisions for financing, Fergus, if you'd like to maybe expand any further. I was actually going to address the, the, the other one of the other questions that was raised about the Paris and the EU ETS, because I think that also gets onto institutions. So the, the question, I think, was something like, um, will Paris be important for, for saving the EU ETS? Um, so I think it's important to think about the links between multilateral um, institutions like the UNFCCC and the, and the Paris process and domestic or regional inst institutions and policies. Traditionally, the way it's worked in international climate policy is that we've focused on uh, overall economy-wide targets for emissions reductions, and then the means of implementing those targets, so the policies and institutions at the domestic level, have been left to the countries, or in the EU's case, the EU as a whole, um, to determine for themselves. So a sort of traditional answer to that question would be, well, the EU has its pledge, how it meets that is up to the EU, and so in a strict sense, what happens in Paris is not really going to bear upon, um, you know, the future of the EU ETS, um, which you know does require reforms. I think to be to be um, more effective. Um, but whilst that's the sort of traditional exam answer, and I think is sort of the correct answer to your to your question, whoever posed that, um, I do think that in future, as we move away from the sort of top-down Kyoto model that focuses intensely or exclusively anyway on, on um, numbers uh, and emissions reduction targets, that there'll need to be an increasing focus at the international level on um, good policy development domestically and good institutions domestically. Um, and this, I think, is largely going to be more of a kind of knowledge-sharing, capacity-building type role, which actually international institutions are reasonably good at, um, certainly better than they are at sort of changing material incentives and imposing penalties and things like that, which is kind of more the, the Kyoto model. Um, and just, just, just finally, on, on the EU ETS, I think is a good example of the importance of institutional design and getting institutions right, and how institutions matter very much um, in doing good policy. You know, as a sort of, if you kind of look at the economic textbook approach to doing carbon pricing, they would say that the difference between a carbon price and, um, sorry, a carbon tax and an emissions trading scheme is purely in terms of one is about price certainty, um, so tax is about price certainty and emissions quantity uncertainty, um, and an emissions trading scheme gives you quantity certainty and price uncertainty. But actually the institutional features um, in terms of um, design, enforcement, um, administration, monitoring and reporting are very, very different for a carbon tax um, and, uh, and an emissions trading scheme. And I think a lot of countries and the EU have struggled with the, getting uh, good institutional designs for their emissions trading scheme. So I think that sort of nicely illustrates that um, some of the challenges and institutional differences that we need to consider when we're designing climate policy. And the more that, as I say, the international process in the future can help countries with good institutional design and policy design, 
um, then perhaps in the future we might see this kind of greater alignment between domestic and regional policy and institutions and, and international policies, and they can kind of help one another more than we've seen in the past. Um, to take up what you said, if you adopt an approach where each actor or each party uh, must pay for its contribution and like a top-down approach, I think the European Union has a lot to do because the mechanism doesn't work well and it needs changing. I would have preferred a different position in which before COP21, we get a clear commitment by Council to mobilize the stability reserve, but Council is not in agreement. Because if the system, the ETS, doesn't work well, doesn't allow us to set the price and channel investments around the price of carbon with signals that are not clear to the market players, then maybe we should reconsider the whole setup or mechanism and go towards taxation, rather. Because in fact, we're in the phase of implementation of this uh, ETS. It needs to be improved without excluding a new mechanism if it proves not to be good enough and if it doesn't provide a clear price of carbon. And I think that the commitments in Paris are linked to that because we are members of the European Parliament and we have some responsibility in the implementation of this mechanism. Thanks very much. I was just waiting for the translation to finish there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear Fergus saying that, that um, the EU ETS um, is, is maybe one thing that Paris doesn't have to preoccupy itself with. We've got other things to worry about at Paris and let, let the EU sort out the EU ETS. Um, I'd be interested um, to hear if, if people feel there's any prospect of it moving to auctioning of allowances rather than the the accruing of them because if you if you don't have a tax in place but if you were auctioning all of the allowances then um well i don't know that you get price certainty but with the quantity certainty that we had um we we didn't wind up with a results certainty even though the the quantities were set but if the, the danger of that is that you don't get the quantity right <laughs> and we've seen what happens with that um given that we are running a bit short of time and i don't see any other pressing problems ha uh, questions having come through there is one about um what about our ambition before 2020 i think our focus really has been more on what we can get out of or how we can raise ambition for the paris agreement beyond 2020 but if anyone would like to add ideas on triggering um, early action before 2020 as well. Maybe you'd like that to add that in. But I think as we're, as we're coming up against four o'clock, I'd just like to give all of the panelists a chance to make um, closing remarks. And we'll do that in the same order that um, we, we did the speaking and, and we're on the program. But Gwyn, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll allow you to pass if your voice has failed you. But um, Corinne, would you like to make any final remarks before we move down? Just a few words. This discussion shows how much work we have to do. Questions of funding are key. They're central. Moving from a top-down approach to a bottom-up approach is not that obvious because it uh, puts into question a number of privileges and uh, positions of power. Maybe that's the starting point, but that's going to be a very difficult starting point. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, Travis, anything in closing? Rien à ajouter à ce stade-ci. Je crois que on a parlé du fonds vert pour le climat, Fergus a parlé du pouvoir de certaines de ces banques d'investissement qui pourraient permettre à l'économie verte de se développer. 
que ce soit 100 milliards ou 300 millions engagés par l'Australie ou l'engagement des États-Unis, je crois qu'il faut que l'argent commence à arriver. Comme je l'ai dit dans mes remarques, je pense que la crainte est venue de gens que la communauté respecte. Mais il y a des opportunités qui nous permettent d'être plus ambitieux et ça, ça n'est pas compris non plus en Australie. Euh, le gouvernement a investi dans des projets d'énergie propre malgré l'hostilité de la population, mais ça n'est pas bien connu et ça montre que le fond vert n'est pas aussi puissant qu'il devrait l'être. Voilà, merci. Top down and bottom up. I, I fully understand the need for a good grounding in bottom up. Um, what we've been finding, I think, in South Africa is that we need both. That you need to be doing things on a bottom up basis to get by in and to be well founded in, in the realities of challenges. But if you only go with the bottom up and you don't keep a top down um, view on things and keep track from that aspect that you, you could wind up with with a bunch of sort of voluntary pledges that don't get us very far and that is one of the, the functions that I see for, for carbon budgeting and something like with an equity reference system to back it up or framework um, is that You can, you can bring in bottom-up pledges, whether it's internationally or whether it's from companies and, and players nationally, but you do need to have a top-down perspective to put those into, well, a, a top-down view to put those into perspective. But do you want to come back on that? I was just going to say that one example or analogy that hasn't been made today, and perhaps should, is, the, is nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. I think the top-down example that was given earlier about an independent verification and transparency mechanism to make sure that commitments are being met and to marry the bottom up with the top down is I think I think that's a plausible analogy to work for on the verification and transparency front. Thank you. And that's something that perhaps can guide some of the consideration around the form and framework of the agreement. Um, but now I'll move on to Fergus as he was skipped earlier in the list. Um, I guess my, my concluding point, um, which captures some of the discussion in the Q&A, is the importance of thinking strategically. Um, I, I said at the beginning of my remarks that we need to think about climate change action as a long-term dynamic process that will get easier over time for various reasons, but we need to accelerate that action because we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, And so, I, and I think sort of some of the discussions about different forms of climate policy, about institutions, top down, bottom up. The way I think about it is, um, and it, this is also relevant for kind of institutional design that I'm talking about, is, you know, every country and, and at the international level, the subnational level, we have an existing system. Um, we have an existing set of infrastructure largely built around a fossil fuel based economy and road based transport, um, which has its own political economic structures and power structures around it. Um, we have existing social norms and existing political institutions. And we need to, you know, adapt and modify and evolve and change and in some cases disrupt um, those existing patterns, you know, over time to get to this long term goal. Um, and so we need to, you know, we're not doing this in a vacuum. And I think some of the challenges that we've faced for, you know, giving two examples, one is the EU, EU ETS when it was designed, and one was, I think, the Kyoto Protocol, which both kind of tried to build, um, they were at least modelled on trying to build a perfect system um, from the beginning, and for various kind of political economy and other sort of challenges, that hasn't worked. I think what we need to increasingly do is look strategically and recognise the power dynamics as well as, and the challenges as well as the opportunities. Um, Ian Golden talked a bit about this earlier um, in terms of building, building on opportunities where they exist, building power structures and alternative coalitions, building new institutions where we can, and then gradually we should see the kind of politics and the economics and the innovation Um, and the social norms converge and, and sort of increasing momentum um, accelerating over time. So I think if we look at where we can make interventions that way and think strategically, then I think we have a better chance than trying to design the perfect 
institutions and solutions right now when that may not be feasible. Um, but I think we can get there in a more kind of evolutionary way. Thank you, Travis and Claire. We are running up against tea time, so just closing sure. comments, thanks. Um, sure, I think this conversation kind of highlighted for me the daunting task that you know we're all facing and trying to raise ambition this year. Um, but I'd like to leave with a positive spin. Um, that the politics are moving forward actually in a positive way that we haven't seen before. I think um, the US-China announcement is a, a great example of that. You know, here in the EU, um, the Green Group, uh, the Green Group, Growth, uh, Green Growth Group. I always have trouble with the, saying that. Uh, they're an ambitious group of countries here in the EU that are pushing Europe to go beyond 40%. Um, you know, using international mechanisms, and I think there's a coalition here that can be built uh, to try and make some progress. And, and um, the U.S. as well, as, as, as Gwyn pointed out, there's a number of challenges that they're facing. But once the clean power plan has been finalized, um, we think there may be some scope for them to go a little bit further and look at some, you know, interesting ideas on how to raise ambition and come up with new finance. Um, and developing countries are, are pushing forward, doing, um, doing action on their own for the first time. So I think, you know, in this bottom-up world that we live in now, um, there's nothing to stop countries coming forward to do more. Thank you, Claire. And Robert, would you like to make any concluding remarks? Very quickly. The difference between left and right wing parties and their climate policy probably devolves into left-wing parties or progressive parties are more willing to try a variety of approaches to climate um, mitigation, including regulatory policy. On the right, the more market fundamentalist the party, the less likely they would even enter their minds to try regulation. And depending on the market does then allow large market actors to dictate progress in a particular country. I might also mention the fact that public opinion in some countries, even those countries in Europe with the highest gas and electricity prices, are supportive of those government policies which may be propping those prices up if they know that their costs are going to climate mitigation policy. So the linking uh, in the public's mind between the costs for climate policies and the result is something that has to be uh, articulated by, by governments, and in particular, it would be progressive that in government that are a, more in a position to, to do this than on the right. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. And Perroche? Thank you. As, pro as a progressive member of the European Parliament, the question of the ecological transition and funding this transition is a real challenge. Because if you want to internalize external costs, you increase the cost of the price of energy. It has an impact on the poorest um, populations. And we must take that into account. This morning, the conclusion was COP21 was like a lab for what multilateralism could be tomorrow, what sort of shape and form it should take. We see that on the issue of funding, we have to be more flexible. We can't remain within a given box. In, on one part, you have the climate. And secondly, you have the way financial markets operate. We have to get out of the box, the climate box, to open the box of the financial markets, because otherwise we won't be able to take up the challenge of climate change. And when you see the debate about bottom up or top down approaches, this debate is quite frequent including in the European Union, for all sorts of situations. In general, people think that the various uh, uh, stakeholders have to take ownership of the challenges. But you have to combine that with solidarity. And that's why you also need a top-down approach, because without a top-down approach, when we have the contribution of member states, if you don't get the expected result in relation to the 2% objective, we will not meet our target. 
approach top down. If we don't have a top down approach, the Green Fund will not work well. So we need to link both approaches. And I want to conclude by noting the work that the European Union should carry out. The European Union was one of the first to offer its contribution to the conference, but we have a lot of discussions between conservatives and progressives, and these discussions or debates have an impact on our ability to contribute to the conference. Let me give you two examples. The ETS system, for example, where you have the interests of various member states. But if we can't set the right price for carbon, then you can't have proper targets for the European Union. And the other thing is, with the Juncker plan, we have no pointers towards energy efficiency, and that is a problem. If we can't do that, it's going to be a missed opportunity. But things are becoming urgent, and we should be more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Père Vanche. And uh, just before I let you go to tea, let me say that one of the things that, that um, the, the president of COP should be talking about, how the um, context is maybe more favorable than it was in the past, is, is worth noting that at least the increase in inequality has been clearly and unequivocally recognized and recognized as a problem not just for people at the bottom of the social scale, but actually a, a problem and a dynamic in society that is, is having negative impacts even on the most privileged. So if we want the UNFCCC to con confront privilege, at least there is a, a greater global awareness of how inequality is not just bad for the poor, but bad for the privileged too. Um, but on that, let me let you go to tea. Thank you very much to the Foundation for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's been a great privilege. Thank you, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>